We are Plum Creek Church, and we are a place where you matter. Our mission here is centered around change lives, changing lives. We believe this happens through three important relationships, intimacy with God, intentionality with family, and influence with others. God has something he wants to say specifically to you wherever you are. Our hope is that you leave encouraged and closer to him than ever before. We'd love to connect with you online at plumcreek.church or on social media to see how Plum Creek is impacting our community and what opportunities we have for you and your family to get connected. If you'd like to support the ministry we're doing here in Castle Rock, two easiest ways are through the Give tab on our website or via your mobile device by texting any dollar amount to 720-606-5563. It's a secure connection with simple instructions to get set up. Thanks again for joining us today. We hope you'll enjoy this message. Well, good morning, everybody. We're so excited that you're here with us. Thank you. I want you to sing this song with us, Unstoppable God.
Welcome Plum Creek family. We are so excited that you have chosen to worship with us here today. We know there's a lot of great churches here in town. Special shout out to those of you who are joining us online this morning. If you ever find yourself in a situation where you can't be here physically on a weekend, you can always check us out online at plumcreek.live. We stream our services live every weekend at 4.30 on Saturday and 9 a.m. on Sunday morning, so check it out. Well, my name is Tommy Cummins, and I'm actually new to the Plum Creek family. It's an honor to be here as I'm now part of our student ministry team. And uh, I just wanted to say thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> You're too kind. Uh, I just wanted to say a big thank you because my family and I, we have already felt so loved and so welcomed here in this community. And if you are new with us here today, my prayer is that you have experienced the exact same thing that we have these past few weeks, which is that this is a community of believers that just loves well. You're gonna hear the phrase changed lives, changing lives here at Plum Creek a lot because we believe that the life change that God has done in us is not only for us. Certainly God wants to do amazing things in and for us, but also through us to continue to transform this valley for his kingdom. If you are new today, we would love the opportunity to connect with you. And one of the best ways to make that happen is by filling out this next step cards, which you'll find in the seat back pocket in front of you. You can fill that out during the service and drop it in the offering as it passes by at the end of service. And don't worry, we're not gonna stalk you or anything weird like that. We would simply love the opportunity to connect with you and to help you figure out how you can step into this amazing community here at Plum Creek. As I mentioned, the offering buckets will pass by at the end of the service. That is simply an opportunity for us to give back to God just a portion of what he has given to us. We want God to be first in every area of our lives, and that certainly includes our finances. We as a church body could not possibly fulfill the mission that God has given to us without all of us coming together in support. In fact, right now on Sunday nights, we have more students coming to our student ministry than we ever have at any point in the history of Plum Creek Church. Yeah, praise God for that, right? And there is no possible way that we could do that kind of ministry without your support, without your generosity, without, without your prayer. And for those of you who show up to consistently love those students well and to shepherd them well, we appreciate your involvement. When those offering buckets are passed by, you can find out there's four easy ways to give here at Plum Creek. If you want more information on that, there's an envelope in the back of the seat in front of you that you can check out for that. If you've been here with us the past few weeks, you know that we have been going through a series called Worthy, and we've been looking at the why behind worship. And on the tail end of that series, we wanted to provide an opportunity for us to come together to corporately worship our good God for a night of worship. And that's gonna happen on October 3rd at 6 p.m. We're just gonna sing some songs of praise to God together. But that's also an opportunity, you can come just a little bit early at five o'clock and you can get a really good meal for just $5. And all of the proceeds from that meal are gonna go to support our students who are going on international missions trips this summer. We would absolutely love to see you there. Well, we're gonna continue in a time of worship together this morning and we're gonna sing a song here in just a second that reminds us that God is still at work in this world. He is still at work in our lives. But before we pray, or sorry, before we worship together, let us say a quick word of prayer. God, we thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to gather together today. God, we thank you for your amazing goodness in our lives. Father, we ask that in these next few moments, whatever it is that we might have carried through these doors with us today, that you can just help us to set those things at your feet. But God, in whatever season we find ourselves in, we are able to, to, to worship you, to surrender to you. God, we thank you that you are a God who is able to move mountains on our behalf. And so, Father, we just pray that you would move in a mighty way today in this place, that your spirit would just be so incredibly thick and evident. 
God, we believe that as we gather together and we hear your word proclaimed that, that God, our lives are gonna be changed as a result of being in your presence. So we ask that you would bless Pastor Doug as he opens your word here today, God, that you would open our hearts and our minds to what it is that you want to say to us. And God, that we can just give everything that we are to you and glorify you in a big way. It's your name that we pray, amen. If you can stand up with us, we're gonna worship together. Come on, church, aren't you thankful that our, our God is faithful today? He's always been faithful. He always will be faithful. We can praise him for that. Let's give him all glory and honor as we sing this together. I'm walking around these walls And I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet I'm waiting for a change to His promise still stands. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail me.
His promise still stands. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never failed me yet. Come on, let's give Him praise in this place today. Jesus, we praise you. Today we worship our God. He's a God of miracles today. The wind and the waves, they obey His voice. And they were still. He's a God of peace today. Whatever you're facing, He is by your side. So let's declare it. Let's worship Him in this place today. I don't want to be afraid every time I face the waves. I don't want to be afraid.
Come on, he's faithful today. Let's sing this out. And I will sing out and all you do. Yeah. 
you are faithful. We praise your name, Lord. You are faith. You are faith. Oh, we praise your name, Lord. There won't be a day. you're not by our side. There won't be a day that, that you let us fall. God, we thank you that, that through the storm, through the wind, through the waves, that you're by our side. That you never leave us or forsake us. And we hold on to that today. We hold on to that knowing that you are good. And God, in this place today, we come to give you far more than a song. We come to give you far more than, than words. But it's in this place this morning that we choose. We choose to give you all glory. We choose to give you all honor. All praise, because all praise is due to you alone, Jesus. And I pray that, that you would be glorified in this place, Lord, in our lives, in our homes. I'd be glorified in our, our schools. That you would be glorified above all. Lord, we love you. We praise you today. In Jesus' name, and everyone said. Aren't you thankful that God is faithful today? Come on. Yeah. He's faithful. We praise you. We praise you. Man, it is so good to see you all here today. Thanks for coming and just making this a priority. Awesome to hear you worshiping today. And at this time, go ahead, grab a seat. What's up, Plum Creek? How are you? Doing good? Excited for some football? Yeah, I see the jerseys are back out. It's good. This is a great time of the year. Hey, real quick, for those of us that are in the room, can you help me give a huge shout out to those that are watching us online right now? Can you thank them for joining us? <clears throat> Thanks, guys. We're glad you're able to join us that way. Thanks for keeping up with us that way. A couple of quick things that I want to uh, talk to you about before I get started with my message today. First of all, over the last several weeks, uh, over 80 people have signed up to, to, um, to participate and help in our children's ministry. Can we thank the Lord for that? That is awesome. You guys are incredible, and I thank you so much for understanding what this is all about and making sure that uh, our kids are well cared for. Now, however, I need to say something. You know this, and I need your help with it. There's a big difference between signing up and showing up, right? So thank you for showing up. The kids are counting on you. They need you. They need folks to be pouring into their lives, and I can't think of a better way for you to be able to spend some of your time on the weekend than to invest in a kid's life. Now, um, if you would help me as well by grabbing this card that is in front of you. We need some help. Uh, we've been talking over the last several weeks about uh, the, the ideas that we're having to help kind of create some more space in our auditorium on Sunday mornings, and so we're getting ready to switch our service times around just a little bit, and I wanna talk to you about that. <clears throat> Starting the weekend of October 13th and 14th, we're still gonna have four services, but we're only gonna have one on Saturday, and that service will be at 4.30. And then our service times on Sunday are gonna change, so we're gonna have three options for you on Sundays, and those times will be 8.30, 10 o'clock, and 11.30. 
and the, um, I will have sign language available at the 10 o'clock service, just so you know, for you can spread the word to those you know that might need that. So uh, that's the plan. Now, here's what I need your help with, and you know the whole heart behind this is that we have always, as a church, been as much about those of us that are here as those of us that aren't here yet, right? We're, we're living on mission. We do church on mission. This is not a country club. Uh, we are on mission in this community, and so I need your help. This is what I need your help with. I need 300 families to commit to coming to the 1130 service, and so if you can help us with that commitment today, if you would just write that down on this card, uh, make sure that you let us know how many people will be coming. I know that God is going to uh, continue to use us in big ways as we reach out to our community, so at the end of our service, when we take uh, our offering, if you can just turn that card in, we would really appreciate it. So thank you for your help in doing that. I also wanna quickly say thank you to Pastor Craig for doing such an incredible job last week. Can you guys thank him for that? Amazing. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, then you've missed an incredible message that he taught last week about the power of our praise. And I wanna encourage you to hop online. You can watch that message. It will touch your heart. It will change the way you think. And it will give you perspective regardless of the circumstances that you're facing. It was an excellent message. I'm very proud of our team. Uh, we have such a great, a great squad. So welcome to week one of our new series that we've called Command Z. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, that's because either you don't use an Apple computer or you don't know how to use the Apple computer you have. <laughs> and if you are a PC person, you don't understand, and at the end of our service, the prayer team will be up front, okay? <clears throat> Command Z is a function that you can use on an Apple computer that will undo whatever you just did. Don't you wish you had a Command Z feature in your life? I know I do. And here's the heart behind this series. As we walk through this for the next several weeks together, uh, the heart behind it is this. God has done so much for his kids, so much. And I fear that sometimes we miss some of what he's done. Can you imagine being God, sending your son to come and die on the cross, paying the ultimate price with his life to provide for you and I some things that are so game-changing that it would be worth that kind of investment only to find out that your children don't fully embrace what he did. It would seem to me that if you paid the ultimate price with your life for someone to provide something for them and they didn't ever really get it, embrace it, make it their own and experience it the way that you had hoped they would, you would feel as though there was not a very good return on your investment. The ROI wasn't good. And I don't, I don't know for sure that this is true, but I have to tell you that when I thought about this series and the things that we were gonna talk about, there have to be some times where he's like, kids, the ROI on this one, this can change your life, it's kind of why I did it. Will you please lean into this? Will you please embrace it, experience it, and make it your own? So let me try and set it up this way. If you're like me, this is an incredible time of the year if you're a sports fan, is it not? I mean, we got baseball heading towards the playoffs. We got college football rolling. We got the NFL starting and fantasy football's going and this is just like a, a season of full activity. It's wonderful. But to me personally, this is not the most exciting football season in our calendar. I love college basketball. And I personally think the NCAA tournament is the best sporting event that we have opportunity to experience on an annual basis. I love it. Do you fill out a bracket? I fill out a bracket every year. I've been doing that for a long time, since I was probably in junior high, and uh, only two times have I won. One time, uh, and it was not perfect. Anybody ever had a perfect bracket? You're lying if you do. No one, do you know this is a fact, no one has ever been able to substantiate and prove that they completely picked their bracket right. Yet every year I'm highly convinced that this is the year for me, right, that I'm gonna get this right. As a matter of fact, if you work at uh, Berkshire Hathaway, they have an incredible NCAA office pool because their CEO, Warren Buffett, offers a prize of $1 million 
per year for the rest of your life if you will pick a perfect bracket through the sweet 16. And nobody's gotten there. <laughs> kind of makes you want to temporarily have a job at Berkshire Hathaway in March, doesn't it? But if you have never had a perfect bracket, you're in good company, and it kind of reminds me of life. How about you? How many times have you kind of had that reset moment? Maybe it was the beginning of a year. Maybe it was just something happening. You said, now, I'm gonna start doing this differently. Maybe you just felt a challenge in your heart, you know, like anger in check, and I'm gonna get this 100% right every time. Have you been there? Only to find out that 100% every time doesn't work. And we live, in a lot of ways, defeated because that's what we're trying to do. And if you've ever been very aware of your imperfection, I promise you're not alone. You're in very good company. As a matter of fact, if you have your Bibles, if you would turn to Romans chapter seven, I wanna share with you these very, very powerful words from the Apostle Paul. Some of you will know who he is. He's one of my favorite people in the Bible. I have a church planter's heart, and he was a church planter. On top of that, he wrote many of the books that we read in the New Testament. And in Romans chapter seven, verse 14, he, his words kind of describe me sometimes. And I think they're likely to describe you too. Romans chapter seven, verse 14, he says this. The trouble is with me, for I am, I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. Have you ever been there? Jump down to verse 21. He says this, he continues, I have discovered this principle of life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power at work within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? You see, this battle isn't a new one. And it's not as though God has entirely missed the fact that we will be facing and dealing with this battle in our lives. As a matter of fact, if I am God, this battle that we're talking about today is of the highest of my priorities. And we know that's true when we read scripture because he cared about it so much that he would send his son to come and fix it. I think when the Lord would look down today at Plum Creek, those of us that are sitting here, he would say, if we're gonna start this Command Z series, this would be where we would need to start. Because ultimately, that's our Heavenly Father's heart from the very, very beginning. If you're taking notes, I'd love for you to write down our main thought for the weekend, and, and that's this. That if God was gonna undo something, he would undo unrealized freedom. He would undo unrealized freedom. So we feel trapped so often that it feels hopeless. And I want you to listen again to what Paul said in verse 24. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death. Likely a question that you've thought and felt before as well. Now I want you to jump down to verse 25 and I want you to see what Paul says because it begins to clear up for us and answer this question. He says in verse 25, thank God the answer is Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is in my mind I really want to obey God's law but because of my sinful nature I am a slave to sin. Chapter seven ends. Aren't you glad that Paul didn't just drop the pen at chapter seven? Because if you turn the page, one page over, we'll find ourselves nestled into Romans chapter. Oh, that's not good enough. <laughs> and here's the good news. Chapter eight in Romans is incredible. An incredible chapter. This is unbelievable stuff. As a matter of fact, let, let me just share with you this. If you're discouraged or depressed, you need to read Romans chapter eight. If you in your life struggle with guilt, you need to read Romans chapter eight. If you struggle with sin, 
You need to read Romans chapter 8. If you're going through trials, you need to read Romans chapter 8. If you don't know how to pray, you need to read Oh, we're getting there, church. If you're struggling with assurance of your salvation, you need to read. That's good. And this week, you're going to declare that I'm going to read. Yes, that's so good. One theologian once said that if the Bible were an engagement ring, the book of Romans would be the diamond. And inside of that diamond, Romans chapter would be the very sparkling point of the jewel. This is the book that historians will tell you so dramatically touched the heart of Martin Luther, this chapter included, that it initiated the Reformation. There's a noticeable shift from Romans chapter 7 to Romans chapter Romans chapter seven, the word I is frequent, the law is prominent and the sin is dominant. But when we turn the page to Romans chapter eight, things change. The Holy Spirit is a frequent term that's used throughout this chapter. As a matter of fact, it's used 18 more times than any other New Testament chapter. God's grace is prevalent and God's Persevering love and the victory over sin is dominant. Let me tell you guys, Romans chapter eight will change your life. I wanna zero in first on the first four verses. And it's in these verses that Paul begins to address what we're talking about today, very practical, dealing with two very real issues, guilt and sin. Remember our main thought, that if Jesus was here today, what I know he would say to us, one of the things that I want to undo is unrealized freedom. So look at verse one of Romans chapter eight. So now, there is no condemnation. That's for somebody here today. You're living paralyzed by your past. You've invited him to be the Lord of your life and your past continues to haunt you. Please hear what Paul says here as he begins Romans chapter eight. There is no condemnation, but not for everybody, right? There is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Because we've talked about this before, we know sin always leads to death. It always does. Look at verse three, the law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weaknesses of our sinful nature. So let me kind of just rewind for a second and remind you just a little bit about what Paul is talking about here. If you've heard of perhaps this series of verses that, that many have called the Romans Road. Have you heard of that before? The Romans Road. If you, the first verse that's part of the Romans Road is Romans chapter three, verse 23, that says this, everyone in this room here today has sinned, all of us. For all have sinned and fallen short, every single one of us. Unfortunately, that's not where the story ends. Because then Paul shares with us in Romans chapter six, verse 23, that there's a penalty for that. The wages of sin is death. Because sin always leads to death. I want you to see what he says in Romans chapter eight. Let's look at verse three. So God did what the law could not he sent his own son in a body like bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. There it is. Do you remember? The wages of sin is death. And there was only one way for that to be repaired. So he sent his son to come and die to pay the price for you and I. So he, he, he sent his son, and in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving us his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the spirit. I want to illustrate this to you this way because I'm telling you, I'm about the most simple theologian you'll ever find. 
We gotta keep it simple. If we keep it simple, I feel like we can get our arms wrapped around it. So I want to explain this to you with some really beautiful word pictures. And I promise you, my artistic skills are off the chart. Okay, ready? So the first thing that I wanna do is draw a picture for you that you, and if you're taking notes, you might want to take, uh, write these down so that you can uh, remember this in the future, perhaps to tell someone about it. How about that for drawing, huh? Let me tell you what I just drew here. This is someone that is spiritually dead, okay? This represents your life. This chair is a beautiful throne, the throne of your life. This picture represents you on the throne of your life and the Lord outside of your life. This is spiritually dead. So if you're taking notes, you might wanna draw that. Okay? This is what we've just been describing. That's what Romans chapter three, verse 23 says. This is what Romans chapter six, verse 23 says before we make a decision to accept Christ as our Lord and Savior. And if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus and you're here today, this is what your life looks like. Okay? I'm glad you're here because I want to show you another drawing. This drawing is the life of someone who is dynamic spiritually. Two important distinctions that I must show you. You said yes to Jesus and brought him into your life, but then you also put him on the throne of your life, which means that he's the one calling the shots. This is what it means for you to be spiritually dynamic, okay? You might wanna draw that, you might wanna remember that, and you might wanna continue to challenge yourself to live this way. When you hear this message and you make a personal decision to accept what God has done, knowing that what he did, he did for you, you make this decision to accept him as your personal Lord and Savior, and your life looks different because you put him on the throne of your life. Look at Romans chapter eight, verse five. So those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. Look at verse 10. And Christ lives where? Within you. He lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you've been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. That's dynamic, guys. That is life-changing. Lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living in you. Now listen, I don't think I've shared anything that it's likely you, you've probably heard something like this before. You've heard us talk about this here. As beautiful as my drawings are, they're not that novel. They make sense. It maybe gives you an image to understand biblical truth, but here's where things get tricky, right? Because you know this. Many of you have made this decision, and if you haven't, I'm gonna give you a chance to do that today. You've made this decision. If this is truth, then why do we still seem to struggle with sin in our lives? What's going on? Because as much as we know this, I'm convinced that there are many times that that doesn't rec represent the victory that we're hoping to experience. Look at verse 12. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die, because that's where sin leads, to death. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live, for, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. See, there's something different about this dynamic life. When we say yes to bringing Jesus in and putting him in the proper place on the throne of our life, there is a power at work in us that looks differently. But there's, see, here's the issue. Here's the problem. All too often, we find ourselves navigating the challenges of life on our own. 
not relying on the power of the Spirit of God. As a matter of fact, if you go to Barnes and Noble, do you know what the most popular section of Barnes and Nobles is? It's the same on Amazon, the self section, right? Go home this, this afternoon and log on to Amazon and just search self-help books. Watch what happens. And I'm challenging you today with this thought. This is the problem. This is the problem. Because somehow we've been tricked to believe that inside of me, I should have the strength to overcome, defeat, and deal with sin in my life. That was never the way our Heavenly Father intended or planned for it to be. When I looked up the self-help section on Amazon, let me tell you, there's some incredible titles listed in the books available in the self-help section. Many of them I can't share with you today while I'm standing up here in front of our church because my mother wouldn't be very happy. (laughs) On the first page, three out of the list included an F-bomb. That's some pretty good encouraging self-help. There's others like this that really help you feel motivated. How to be happy? Parenthetical statement in the title, or at least less sad. (laughs) A creative workbook. Man, we're running right out for that one. Probably sold millions. This one's my favorite. You are a badass. How to stop doubting your greatness and start living an awesome life. I just said badass at church. Yeah, it's awesome. And somebody wants to send me an email. Okay. Here's how that works. G Partridge at plumcreek.church. Yeah, I'll get that. I'll get that. Listen, when we look at this self-help stuff, there has to be a better way. So here, here's what happens. For some that are here today, you need to make a decision because what I drew first represents your life and your understanding that I've been trying to fight this battle with the mentality of self-help, but I don't have Jesus in the picture at all and he's for sure not on the throne. So you need to make a decision and I'm gonna give you a chance to do that today so that this image would more clearly represent your life. For others, you've said yes to Jesus, but if you're honest, something isn't right. You've made a decision, but yet you still feel defeated by your past and overwhelmed by the battles that you're fighting today. That doesn't seem to be the life that the Apostle Paul is talking about in Romans chapter eight when he begins to lay out for us the solutions of dealing with the challenges, and here's why. Here's why. Let me explain to you that my fear is that this most accurately describes all too often myself and likely you too. So let me show you this other diagram. It's not going to be that surprising to you because I think this represents our lives. Please write that down. And when you look at this, let me show you what this looks like because you feel this way. That's a defeated spiritual life. There's one very obvious difference, right? It's what you do, and I know it's what I do. You see, I feel a whole lot like the Apostle Paul. I love the Lord. But I have this uncanny ability to crawl back up on the throne of my life. And so I need to get to the place where I recognize when I'm feeling defeated, when sin seems to be winning again, that I'm relying on my power, not his power. That I'm back on the throne and now I'm calling the shots. And when I get back on the throne, I'm listening to my voice, not his voice. And then we wonder, God, why am I living defeated? I've said yes to bringing you in, but I keep crawling back up on here and we will never experience the abundant life, the promises of victory over sin if we keep crawling our tail back on the throne of our lives. We need Jesus in his proper place. We need to hear his voice, not our voice. We need his power, not our power at work in our lives. And when we live that way, guys, we begin to realize the freedom that he came to die for. The problem with the church is this, that all too often this is the diagram that represents your life. 
represents my life. Which brings us back to the heart behind this series. Too many of us are living defeated. What would Jesus undo? If he could command Z something, if he could undo something, what would it be? He would undo unrealized freedom. Romans chapter 8 verse 13 says, But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, listen, you will live. That's what we want. That's what he wants. So how do I? How do I undo this unrealized freedom? How do I do go through the, the efforts of making sure that my life doesn't look like this but that I continue to live in a way where I'm putting him back on the throne. Instead of living defeated, I'm living dynamic. How do we do that? Will you write this verse down? I want you to memorize it. John chapter 8, verse 36. If the Son sets you free, you are truly free. See, here's the thing that you and I know and I have realized in my life too. You live a pretty busy life. Got a lot of demands on your life. A lot of things pulling at you. When you wake up in the morning, it's easy to be overwhelmed, isn't it? It's for me too. I'm a busy guy. Got a lot of expectations on me and a lot of things that I need to get done. And I tell you, when I wake up in the morning, one of the things that I have just been conditioned to think about, just like you, is that I want a great ROI on the investment of my time. I got a long list of things that need to get done. Got a lot of appointments, meetings, sermons to write, people to talk with. And I want my day to have a really great return on the investment of my time. I do, just like you. But see, the problem is that all too often I find myself living a defeated spiritual life as well. If I'm not careful and you're not careful, see then the time that we have, limited time every day, doesn't count the way that it should. I want a real ROI and so do you. And here's what I've learned and I've said it before, but now with the context and the foundation of what we've talked about from Romans chapter, it proves that I'm right and that is this. Doug is a completely different person when my life looks like this. I am a completely different man when Jesus is in the proper place on the throne of my life. The second I climb back up on there, all bets are off. I become a completely different person that nobody really loves to be around. Like I become a different kind of man when Jesus is in the right place. I become a different kind of husband when Jesus is in the right place. My words sound different when Jesus is in the right place. My thoughts look different when Jesus is in the right place. My anger looks different when Jesus is in the right place. You see, when, uh, when Jesus is in the right place, I become a different kind of daddy. When Jesus is in the right place in my life, I become a different kind of leader. I become a different kind of friend. I become a different kind of pastor when Jesus is in the right place in my life because it's what Paul told us. We have to have the power of God at work in our lives. We have to have him calling the shots, not me. And I know this is not just true for me. This is true for you too. If you doubted it, wives right now, do the elbow. Because you know it's true. You can look your husband in the eyes, listen to the words that come out of his mouth, and know if he's been close to Jesus. You know it. That kid gets 20 bucks. <laughs> Talk to Gary. <laughs> Listen, your thoughts will look different. Your struggles will look different. When you are close to Jesus and he's on the throne of your life calling the shots, when it's his voice that you hear instead of your voice, your attitudes, your anger, your pride, your selfishness, your stewardship, it's all gonna look different. So how do we do this? If you're in this room, for those of you that are watching online, I know it looks a little different for everybody, but real quick, I wanna open up my life a little bit and I wanna show you what's working for me, 
okay? When I get up in the morning, I know that I must, before my day even begins, get Jesus back on the throne. (laughs) Because I keep crawling up there all the time. So first thing I do in the morning is make a pot of coffee. It's spiritual. (laughs) And I get a cup of coffee, and I go grab my Bible and my journal, and I go sit on the back patio if the weather's great. And I find this quiet place, and before I even begin, I say, Lord, you know me. I'm going to crawl back up on that throne, and I don't want to. I want you to be calling the shots in my life. So I'm going to open your book this morning, and I want you to speak to me. You show me what I need to hear today. You give me those thoughts. You impress these things on my heart that I need. And then I start to read his word. And you know, he is so faithful. And then I take my journal, and when I look at those things, those principles, those truths that are coming off the page that I want to remember that I want to reflect on, that I want to think about. It's not enough for me to just see it. I have to write about it. And then I write those things down. And one of the habits that I've formed over the last couple of years is that then those verses become the very words to my prayer that morning. And then I look over the calendar of of, uh, assignments and responsibilities and meetings and duties that I have, and I, I, I walk through my day and I say, Lord, I want you to be on the throne of my life when I have this appointment and when I walk into this meeting and I know that Doug has the tendency to crawl back up on the throne, but when I get to this appointment, I want you on the throne, Lord. And then I spend some time looking back at the previous day to make sure that I've done what he's been talking to me about. Can I tell you one that he keeps hitting me with? Miller. Slow to speak. That's going to be like a mantra for a long time. I wonder what it could look like for you this week if you started to get more intentional about making sure that Jesus was in the right place on the throne of your life. I know what it'll look like dynamic. But you know what else I've learned? Doing that just once in the morning, it's not enough. Because about the time I get my third cup of coffee and start heading in, you know where I'm crawling? Right back up on here. Listen, I know this is so simple, but I promise you, you want a dynamic spiritual life the way that God is calling you and desiring for you and died for you to have? This is the key. This is the key. And I promise you that when you do this right, you're going to feel it dynamic in a completely different way. Because it's not your voice that you're listening to, it's his voice. It's not your power that's pulling you through, it's his. And listen, who doesn't want that? Please don't forget, bow your head. He died for you to experience it. Maybe this week you're going to make a decision to put a reminder on your phone three times every day that just tells you, put Jesus back on the throne. If we did that together, there would be a different kind of dynamic spiritual life that we would be experiencing. If you're in this room and your life represents that first circle that I drew and you know that you've been trying to navigate life on your own, in your own power, in your own strength, and you want your, the description of your life to change. You want to invite Jesus in, and you want to put him on the throne. If you're in this room today, I want to tell you, this is your moment. This is why you're here. And I've been praying all week for this moment right now. That in your life, you would feel the Lord pulling and tugging at your heart. It's likely you feel it right now. And you would say, you know what, Doug? Today, I'm going to put him on the throne. If that's you and you're over here on my left, every head's bowed and eyes are closed, if you would just quickly raise your hand so I know who I'm praying with. If you just shoot your hand up, yep, I got you. Yep, yep. Okay, you can put them down. How about here in the middle? In the middle, somebody in the middle? Yeah, I see it. Yep, anyone else? Got it, put your hands down. Over here on my right, your left? Yep, I got you, bud. Put it down, okay, perfect. Now listen, let me ask you this question too. 
For those of you that would say, you know, I've made this decision, but I keep crawling up on that throne and I want it to be different starting this week. Doug, would you pray for me too? Would you raise your hand? Yeah, it's all of us. I even got one double hand. Father, would you see our hearts today? When I read your word, I know what you came for. You want us to experience a dynamic relationship with you that's so game-changing that it's your voice we hear and it's your power that's at work in us. And I thank you for those that are in this room that raised their hand that said, Doug, you know, I want the Lord in my life and I need the Lord on the throne of my life. And if that was you and you've never made this decision before, if you would just simply pray this prayer, God, I know as Doug said earlier, as Romans communicated and as Paul wrote, all have sinned and fallen short of God's perfect standard and that includes me. I'm very aware. And I'm thankful, Lord, today that I don't have to be the one that pays the price for that because you sent your son. And so today I thank you for that. I ask you to come into my life. I ask you to be the Lord of my life. And I ask that that same power that that helped you raise from the dead, Lord, that that power would be at work in me to overcome, to live dynamic, to live Romans chapter eight. And Lord, for all of us that raised our hands Lord, even those that are online watching right now, I pray that you will meet with them in the room that they're sitting in, that they would feel the presence of God overwhelmed in this moment right now with a different kind of focus that this week is going to look different and we're gonna start it today. Lord, will you help us to be reminded and to check our hearts every time we crawl back up on that throne? Will you help us to live different with your power at work in us not defeated by our past, no condemnation, not overwhelmed by sin because the power of the Spirit is at work in me. Let it be so this week, we pray in your name. Amen.